Good morning and welcome to the quiet, very quiet, early morning streets of Pi. It's still pretty dark because the sun hasn't quite come out yet. I'm walking towards the large white Buddha statue that is on the hill outside of Pi. I haven't been up there yet. It's supposed to provide a nice view of the city. A lot of people go up there for a sunset. Uh, I'm more of an early morning person than a night person, so I thought I would go up there for a little bit of a sunrise. It's a really strange morning because uh, to my horror, to my utter horror, it's been raining. And it's not supposed to be doing that. Like, where is this rain coming from? I uh, had plans to go up there this morning and I was sitting on my bed in my uh, guest house, typing away on my computer. And I heard this weird noise. I thought, what is that sound? I couldn't figure out what it was or where it was coming from. And it finally dawned on me that it was the sound of rain. And that just struck as I said, a horror in my heart because I've lived through so much rain here in Thailand. I got so tired of constantly checking the weather forecast and trying to figure out, is it going to rain today? Can I go outside today? And on this trip to the north of Thailand, one of the great things I thought would be, hey, you know, it's the best time of year. It's sunny all the time. It doesn't rain. It's nice and cool. You can just go and do whatever you want any day and you never even have to think about anything. And yet the last little while, there I am checking the, war the weather forecast again. It's like, oh, I'm, you know, I want to go do this tomorrow. Is it a good day? Is it going to rain? Is it not going to rain? So I don't know what's going on. Yeah, not very happy about it, that's for sure. But, I uh, settled in and decided to wait out the rain a little bit and it's still sprinkling right now. The rain is still coming down, but it's pretty much tapered off. So I thought, well, I'm awake. I've had my morning coffee. GoPro's all charged up and ready to go. So let's go for a walk up to the Buddha mountain anyway. There might be other people up there. I'm not sure. I read that uh, people go up there for early morning meditation and yoga poses. And I would have dismissed that as something that would have happened, you know, decades ago, back in Pi's more uh, hippie-ish days. But yesterday, I was up pretty early and I rode my scooter over the mountains back towards Mei Hong Sun because I wanted to visit the Lode Cave. And the Lode Cave is about halfway between Pai and uh, Mei Hong Sun. So I was sort of retracing my steps by about 50 kilometers. And at one point, you reach the highest point of the mountains, and there's a lookout point there. So I stopped to uh, look at the view, and there were, I don't know, a dozen people there. They seemed to be part of a yoga class, I think. They had an instructor and they were all doing yoga things and striking various poses as they looked out over the, uh, over the valley below towards where the sun was rising. And I, I know nothing about yoga, but I assume there are specific movements and postures associated with greeting the sun in the morning. For all I know, that's the actual name of the routine they were going through, you know, greeting the sun. But yeah, there are a lot of people up there uh, doing yoga, some sitting cross-legged on the ground and uh, meditating. And <laughs> I felt very awkward as I show up with uh, all my various cameras in tow. I don't want to disturb any of these people. Well, you know, I, I stayed off to the side and stayed quiet and just Took a couple of pictures of the sunrise, the mist in the valley below. So it was all very, very nice. And that might be similar. I might encounter a similar scene up at the, the White Buddha. I'm still having a fantastic time here in Pai. I really am. I've just been enjoying this place for so, so many reasons. 
and uh, I'm enjoying all the lanterns. You can see some of the, the lights still on the bridges and the streets here. I noticed in particular the other night when I was out with my uh, new friend Leon quite late at night and we were remarking on all the lanterns that were still all like hanging over the street everywhere. And I assumed they were a, sort of a holdover from the Lantern Festival. And I wondered whether they would be coming down. And in fact, over the last couple of days, I've seen work crews all over the city with ladders and trucks and other equipment busy, you know, taking down all of these uh, lights and all the lanterns that you see around me. So I guess they, I mean, there's so many of them. I'd love to find the warehouse where they store these things from year to year. They'd have to have a massive storage facility just to keep all these things and keep them in good condition for the next, uh, the next Lantern Festival. I was just walking over a bridge, by the way. I guess you can't really see anything, but there's a, a river here that runs through Pi. And uh, that, that adds a lot to the atmosphere of the city. Maybe after I walk up to the Buddha and come back down, I can go for a walk in downtown Pai uh, and down by the river and show you what that looks like. It's really quite interesting. You're right in the middle of a busy city in a way, but with that right beside that river, you'd swear you were in a village. It adds uh, remarkably to the atmosphere of the town because of that rural feeling you get near the river. Plus, there's so many uh, inexpensive bungalows and resorts and places to stay all lined along that river. Some nice places as well, expensive places, but a lot of like really low budget places too. So, and you, you get this uh, uh, added feature of your time in Pai where you can wake up in your bungalow beside the river. You probably get some beautiful bird song, things like that. And then you walk, one ac walk across one of the many suspension bridges, like narrow, pedestrian bridges built with bamboo and cable and whatever it is they, they use to build the bridges and walk over these narrow pedestrian bridges over the river, you know, into Pai itself. So whenever you go to the walking street and back to your bungalow, you're always walking across the river over one of these narrow bridges. And yeah, that would be, uh, yeah, that would just be a lot of fun. That'd be a really interesting place to stay. And that's the direction where I'm heading. I think uh, most people, as I said, go there for sunset because the sun would be setting on the other side of Pi. So when you're up on the hill, you're looking towards the sunset. When I get up there, the, the sunrise will be behind me. But that'll be kind of fun because uh, you could, the sun will come up behind me, behind those hills, and then I can see it lighting up the hills on the other side and then slowly lighting up the town. I don't know if you just saw that, but a woman went by, a foreigner, obviously, riding a bicycle with a huge backpack on her back. And uh, I tried to uh, make eye contact and uh, give a wave, but uh, she didn't look in my direction. <laughs> but yeah, I just love little scenes like that because this is such a classic backpacker town. And I haven't been around a, a scene like this for a long, long time. So like when you get to an intersection, I'm at an intersection here where I turn towards the, uh, the Big Buddha, as they call it. It's even called the Big Buddha on Google Maps. But you get things like this. I mean, look at this uh, sign. You know, so you've got uh, the Shan, Shan Doi Backpacker Resort, 800 meters in that direction. The Pai Los Resort, and then all these resorts, activities, tattoo parlors, taxi service, uh, monkey tubing to go rafting down the river, the Pi Circus Hostel, dog grooming, farm stay, romantic time mountain resort, Pi Country Hut, uh, yeah, space bamboo tattoo. I've been actually uh, eating at a Vietnamese sandwich place, I think is right beside Space Bamboo. It's a very popular place to get uh, tattoos, as far as I can tell. Pie Homie, Pie Smile, Monko in Pie. What's this one? Vimarn, Vimarn Kiri Resort. Just 
on and on. Yoga, cave trips, VIP buses, all this language I just haven't seen for years. And it's really cool to see. Yeah, a whole bunch more. Yawning fields, guest house. A lot of vegetarian restaurants here, vegan restaurants. And that's just one side of the road. Look at that, over here we've got a brand an entire new set. I really love the names. It really conveys what this town is all about, or maybe perhaps what it used to be about. I don't know, the tone has been changing over the years. Got a chill out bar. Oh, Pie's most popular restaurant, the Blue Ox. That's where uh, Leon and I went for our cocktails. The Black Monkey motorbike and car for rent. Two huts viewpoint. It's time for a new sunset at sundown. Yeah, just on and on. A bunch more over here. Some older, more classic signs. Some older resorts. And then over here, a whole bunch more just at the side of the road. But let's head in that direction. And I've had kind of encounters with that world, which has been a lot of fun. I went to the Pie Canyon the other morning. Really enjoyed that. I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. But when I showed up there, there were three other foreigners showing up at the same time on their scooters. It's not so popular in the morning. It's more of a sunset viewing spot again. But I went there early in the morning and these three other people did. And chatted with them a little bit, but then later on a young German guy showed up and we met on one of those narrow paths at the Pie Canyon. And as you do when you run into another foreigner, you stop and you chat and you exchange all your travel stories, you know. How long have you been in Thailand and how did you get in? That's the new topic of conversation, right, with COVID. Did you have to do quarantine and what about vaccinations? And uh, he got into the country when they had this, I don't know much about it, some sort of stop and go program where you could come into Thailand without doing quarantine. Uh, and he got in just before they canceled that program because of Omicron. So he was lucky in that regard. And he was telling me about everywhere he went in Chiang Mai. He was asking me what I'd seen earlier on the loop places I'd recommend staying at or going to see. You know, the typical foreigner conversation on the road. And I love those. So we chatted for a while. And I went out onto the uh, walking street the other night. Just, uh, you know, snacking my way from one end to the other, taking in the atmosphere. And then I stopped at this little roadside bar and it was a quiet night. This was the middle of the week, so it wasn't that busy. And I had a, they only had two tables at the side of the road, this bar. One table was occupied, five or six foreigners sitting there. They sounded like big Australian rugby dudes, I think. And uh, I was sitting at the other table by myself. And then uh, two other foreigners showed up and they were looking around for a place to sit. And of course they made eye contact with me and they asked, you know, do you mind if we join you at your table and I'm like, yeah, no problem. Take a seat. And I just enjoy that sort of casual social encounter so much. I never met these people before in my life. I had no idea who they were, what they were about. But uh, yeah, sit down at, uh, sit down at my table and uh, I found a way to open a conversation and we were chatting. I found out they were from the Netherlands. My family is, you know, my family cultural heritage is from the Netherlands. So we had that in common. And yeah, we just dove into conversation about all the topics you could think of. And to my surprise, uh, this has been a big theme of my time in Pi. They had been traveling all over the place because I'm used to this idea that you can't go anywhere, that borders are closed. It's impossible to do. There's so many restrictions. It's too expensive. There are no flights. And all these people in Pi, all these foreigners that I've been talking to, they just chat like it's 
1999 or 2010. They're just going about their lives. This couple from the Netherlands, I think they'd been to India, then they went to Nepal, then they flew here, then they're going to go to Cambodia, then they're going to go to Indonesia. And I'm like, what? What? Is this even possible? But all these people are just traveling all over the world now, it seems, despite uh, COVID, despite Omicron. And as they explained it to me, well, if you're willing to pay the money to do this, to be able to change your plans on an instant, just fly anywhere that's open, go through all the hoops, you know, do all the paperwork, stay in the quarantines and pay for that. I heard recently that a friend of mine, a friend of a friend of mine, who went to uh, Korea, had to uh, foot a bill of $3,000 US for his quarantine uh, to enter South Korea. And that was, that's what I've been thinking about that, well, I can't go anywhere because I can't afford $3,000 for quarantine. But it's so much fun to be in Pi with all these people that are just roaming around the world as if, as if nothing is different, you know? It's just been relaxing, you know? It's been enjoyable just to be around this kind of a casual social atmosphere. It doesn't feel so restricted, you know? Slowly working my way towards, I don't want to call it the Big Buddha. It seems disrespectful, but that's what everyone seems to call it, all the tourism literature and Google Maps just refers to it as the Big Buddha. Uh, it was up there, I could see it, just between these two trees. You can see a bit of white there, and that is the, uh, the Big Buddha. What is this place? The Pai Pu Fa guest house or resort. There are so many guest houses, resorts, hostels, hotels in Pai. It's kind of astonishing how many there are. It's a big part of your experience as a tourist being here, just looking at all the other hotels. I mean, the hotels themselves are kind of a tourist attraction, just to wander around and look at them all and compare all their features. Nas Kitchen. Spicy Pie Backpackers. Oasis Chilling Space. Ban Ing Na Pai. Oh, a bunch of places off in this direction. And you see, I don't know whether this is common from the past, but you now see a lot of signs out front where they're advertising their rates. They actually tell you, which is kind of cool. So here you get an air conditioned uh, bungalow for 400, fan only for two. Monthly for 2000 Look at that. Well, that's something to think about, right? I'm all about the monthly. But yeah, look at this place. Spacious, quiet, nice bungalows over there, and then some rooms over there. A lot of artwork on the walls, colorful paintings of monkeys and bears and toucans. Nice little uh, restaurant at the front. Yeah, that's pie. That's basically pie in a nutshell, what you're looking at right here. Monthly for 2000. Uh, <laughs> I'm coming up on the end of my current visa with hopes of getting another 60 day visa. I have to return to Mesot shortly to do that. And it occurs to me, well, uh, what do I do when I have that uh, another 60 days? Oh, <laughs> before I babble on more, um, high atmosphere look at this i love that room uh, that sign room food and drink a la, a la kate a la carte slow breakfast i don't know what that is sounds good homemade yogurt natural herbal tea hill tribe coffee you can get t-shirts candle bags i don't even know what a candle bag is a scarf every good backpacker especially from europe needs a scarf postcards hand-woven, natural dyed fabric. It's just, oh, it's just great. There it is, the big Buddha. So we have some, uh, some climbing to do yet to get up there. We've got some time. 
I was just thinking, as I said, about my next 60 days. Heck, you could come up here and get one of those rooms for 2,000 baht a month, settle in and live that pie life. I don't think you'll ever find me meditating or doing yoga and eating uh, organic muesli and yogurt, but uh, I, can, I can enjoy the atmosphere of pie in my own, uh, my own planet dug ways. Man, yeah, this is an interesting area out here. I just spotted another big grouping of uh, signs for various places you can stay. It's a place that really caters to travelers of various types. Lots of laundry places, water, like pure water vending machines. It's just a very uh, convenient town. Homemade bread, organic this, organic that, vegan, everything. Yeah, I mentioned uh, Pie Canyon going there the other morning, and that was a wonderful surprise. I know about Pie Canyon as well. I mean, I heard about it my whole life. For all I know, I've already been there. My, uh, my memory is so poor these days. Trips that I went on from 20 or 30 years ago, I have no memory of them. I don't even remember going to these places anymore. So for all I know, I've already been to the Pie Canyon and I just forgot. If I didn't take any pictures on a trip, that trip technically doesn't even exist. But yeah, um, the Pie Canyon is not a big place. This is not the Grand Canyon of the United States. It's, it's not a massive geographical feature, but it has its own uh, really interesting uh, quality. So I walked up there and as most people do, the first thing I noticed was the steep, steep drop off from the edge of the trail. It's, uh, yeah, it's really quite something kind of startling when you walk up there and then you walk over, get closer to the edge of the trail, then you look over and of course there's no safety barriers or ropes or anything like that. So yeah, that's really quite something. And uh, this place has been eroding for millennia. I just arrived at the place where you turn to head upward into the hill. And this is the, the temple name Wat Prathat Mayen. And I assume the, the big Buddha is connected with this temple. The temple is lower on the hill than the Buddha itself. So I guess you go to the temple first and then you climb up. But this is really interesting. You've got this classic Thailand Buddhist temple imagery on one side and then right across the road you've got the backpacker world. Look at that. Earth tone. Hand painted sign for this place. Food, ice cream, dessert, probiotic, natural products. Very cool. Healthy food by Earth Tone. Open 10 to 6. Last order 5.30. Earth Tone will close every Wednesday. We will start on December 1st. But yeah, here's uh, what they serve. You know, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, look at the setting here. Very wet now that it started raining again. It's even wet even without the rain because there's so much mist and fog every morning. So much condensation. So let's head in onto the temple grounds. I've got the local dog posse tracking me down. They're not too happy with me. Just keeping an eye on them. There they go. They've lost interest. Oh, another one. Yeah, a lot of dogs around here. Been giving me a bit of a hard time this morning. Oh, another, uh, another pooch. Hey, poochie. <laughs> it's funny how you get the, uh, the dog warning signal. If one dog down below barks at you. Man, I can see five of them down there. 
all the other dogs further up the hill hear the barking and they get ready for whatever trouble might be on the way. So all the dogs know you're here. Okay, so I'm at the base of the, uh, the big Buddha. And I guess you can ride part way up. So if you go in that direction, that way, by bicycle, scooter, or car. But if you're on foot, you can just take these uh, stairs. So I guess the first set of stairs goes up to the temple. And then there, oh, look at this dog. He's a real ac acrobatic. Oh, he was. Yeah, look at that, running right along the edge. He's figured out that that's easier. Hey there, pooch. I'll move aside for you. There you go, lots of room. You don't have to worry about me. <laughs> well, he's worried anyway. Anyway, I was saying that the uh, Pi Canyon had been eroded, you know, for thousands and thousands of years. So the trail that is there over time, of course, has been getting narrower and narrower and narrower. And parts of it are like completely gone. So as a visitor now, you know, you're walking along these trails you know, with a steep drop off on each side. And <laughs> it narrows down to like the width of two feet. So it's a lot of fun walking along there. And you, and you can imagine sometime in the future when this or that section of the trail will just disappear completely. And of course, that has already happened. Oh, I can't breathe. Um, several times, certain sections of the trail were just disappeared and then visitors had to sort of carve a new trail around it, you know? And there were a couple of spots where I wasn't sure whether you could even go along the trail or not quite steep little sections, you know, where you had to climb down and back up again. Very slippery stone, a lot of a slippery dust on the stone. But the views were spectacular. The setting was amazing. Yeah, I love the Pi Canyon. I wouldn't mind uh, going back out there for sunset. I heard people down on the walking street talking about sunset parties, I guess, uh, Tour agents like travel groups will even arrange sunset viewing beer parties and uh, everyone piles into these vans with coolers of cold beer, I guess, and ride out to the Pie Canyon and have a cold beer while taking in the, uh, the sunset. Look at this. Hey. Yeah, coming all, uh, all demeanors. <laughs> hey, puppy. He's in Zara. <laughs> Friendly dogs. Oh, 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 don't. Too high, too high. They're so muddy. I have to do laundry, actually, because my, uh, my very limited clothing <laughs> is, is getting quite dirty from the trip. And these, uh, these pooches with their muddy paws aren't helping, are you? They were actually running behind a couple on a uh, scooter. So I think they were, uh, they belonged to that household. And they were uh, chasing the scooter up the hill. But then they stopped to greet me for a minute. I'm not uh, terribly worried about uh, rabies when it comes to stray dogs. You know, you gotta keep an eye out for everything I suppose but uh, one thing about these uh, dogs they're wet dogs <laughs> in your hands yeah I'm now uh, I've got a uh, stinky stinky wet dog all over my hands they all need a bath so I think I can go up to the temple and then through the temple towards the uh, big Buddha as you can see, the sun is getting uh, brighter, or the sky is getting brighter up there. Oh, I haven't turned around for a while. Oh, okay. So there's a pie behind me. We've climbed up a little bit. On my way out to the Pie Canyon, 
I realized that a famous coffee shop called Coffee in Love was on the highway toward heading towards uh, Pie Canyon. So I thought after I visited the canyon, I could stop by a Coffee in Love. Turns out I didn't because I never saw the place on my way out. Um, I guess I was looking in the wrong direction when I passed it. I never saw it. But I've since gone back to it and I've done quite a bit of sort of a research into this coffee shop and why it's so famous. And it turns out that Coffee in Love was in two famous movies. There was a, a movie from Thailand in 2009 called Pie in Love, which I've since watched. And I guess this coffee shop was in the movie. The characters in the movie stopped to take selfies with the Coffee in Love sign at the side of the road. And now, you know, it became very famous for Thai people to come up here and take a selfie in the exact same place. So it's sort of like, go to the coffee shop made famous by the movie, Pie in Love. And then there was a movie, that was in 2009, I think. And then in China, like 2013, 2012, they made a movie that turned out to be something of a blockbuster in China called Lost in Thailand. Kind of a hangover type of movie where a fish and water tale out of like two people from China went to Thailand. One, a businessman on a serious trip. The other, kind of a goofy, fun-loving, troublemaking character. And for various reasons to do with the plot, they kind of teamed up. They had no choice but to team up. And of course, their different ways of living and their different lifestyles uh, got them into conflict and uh, comedy ensued. But apparently this movie was so popular in China that the following year, tourism from China to Thailand rose by 70%. And I read that this coffee shop in particular was a big part of that. And all these Chinese tourists now, like busloads of them, will go to Coffee in Love because it was in this famous movie, Lost in Thailand. I watched the whole movie. I never saw the coffee shop. There was one scene that took place during Songkran, the water festival. There's a big water fight. And our two main, two main characters got caught up in this uh, water fight. Hilarity ensued. And... Um, that might have been uh, like a balcony at the coffee shop, but they never showed the front of it. They never showed a sign. They never showed the name. They never showed coffee. Uh, that might have been coffee in love, but I don't know. I never saw the shop in the movie, so I don't know why it became so popular. Neither movie, by the way, appealed to me very much heading into a temple so and I got my uh, my breath back a little bit I stopped climbing for a while the uh, the movie from Thailand Thai in love I couldn't find a copy with a ooh, ah big reveal there's the stairway up to the uh, the big Buddha And I'm standing right in front of the main uh, stupa here at the bottom at the temple. I'm starting to get a bit more of an expansive view of Pi down below. Very misty. That's probably my main association now with all of northern Thailand. It's been this whole trip, this whole journey has been about mist. It's a misty, foggy place this time of year anyway. It's been beautiful. And you do get such an odd combination of elements in Thailand. I notice that all the time. So you do have this very classic sort of uh, imagery right here. And then right behind the Temple Guardian, on Temple Grounds, you have this, you know? which there's nothing on the planet could be less Thai than this, right? But of course, it's a very uh, popular selfie station, I assume. You can sit there and have your picture taken with a uh, pie in the background. But it's just so odd in tone to 
come across something like that when you're looking at this setting with everything else going on around you. I was just saying that I couldn't find a copy of Pie in Love with subtitles in English. Well, no subtitles at all. And I watched the whole movie, but I had no clue what was going on. I still don't. I have no idea. It made no sense to me at all. It was essentially the story of a bunch of young people. I don't know how many of them. I lost track of them all. Who went on a road trip up to Pi. And then did a bunch of stuff up there. But then the story kept switching to um, other stories that were not related to Pi. There was, you know, characters back in Bangkok. Um, characters all over the place doing all kinds of things and there's something to do with postcards and since it was called pie in love and all these people were very young and very attractive I assumed there was love stories all throughout the movie and there were probably love triangles happening all over the place and there was some classic backpacker imagery with a young guy uh, in a VW van and there's some weird almost surreal sequences that I didn't understand involving some guy standing at the side of the road for hours and hours and hours for no reason at all that I could figure out. He just sat there for the longest time and he freaked out over ladybugs and butterflies and a woman got kicked out of a car at the side of the road opposite him. And she was very pretty and he's a very good looking guy. So I assumed, you know, a romance was going to begin this, you know, meet cute setting, but she never noticed the guy, no matter how much he tried to dance with her and get her attention. And then he disappeared. And then we saw the whole sequence again from her point of view. And instead of a man being on the other side of the road, it was actually a, a zero kilometer mile marker. Like he had never been there the entire time. He didn't exist. He was a ghost. He was a, I have no idea. I cannot tell you anything that happened in this uh, movie. A lot of talking, a lot of sitting in coffee shops, bars, outside their bungalows, taking in the view of Pi, a lot of romantic music and talking about, uh, I don't know what they're talking about. Anyway, I, I didn't get very much from the movie, but it was a lot of fun to see Pi back in 2009. And I don't know whether they filmed it this way, but it looked like a completely different city from what it looks like now. Much less developed, far fewer kind of modern Western style restaurants and cafes and bars. It looked much more like a kind of a traditional Thai uh, village. Small, well, small town. It's still a tourist town even then, but more of a backpacker, off the beaten path kind of place, which it is not anymore. But anyway, that was Pai in Love and uh, Lost in Thailand. I mean, it's fun. Um, a lot of uh, over-the-top histrionics from uh, the <laughs> our two characters. And you can kind of predict everything that was going to happen and how it all played out. I mean, it was kind of fun, kind of funny, but nothing uh, to get too excited about. But it was fun to, to make all these connections, seeing Coffee in Love, knowing about its connection with Pi, uh, Pie in Love, the movie, and this Chinese movie, and the rise of Chinese tourism, you know, it was very interesting to go there. And I did go there for a cup of coffee, and the coffee was, eh, it was really mediocre, and the setting was very nice, so you can go there to watch uh, your choice. Well, I guess sunset would be better. They wouldn't be open early enough for sunrise, I don't think. But, yeah, I mean, it's worth going there just to uh, see the, the view, but uh, don't expect much from the coffee in my humble opinion. Um, I walk through the temple, but again, oh, maybe there's another exit over there. I was just going to say that I can't get from the temple to the next stage because there is a closed and locked gate here and kind of a, a bit of a drop off with some wire. They don't want anybody even getting around, but I just noticed there's another gate over here. Maybe I can... Uh, go out this way. I'm often finding I get trapped in places in Thailand too. There is an access when I think there should be or could be, but here's the access I need. Yeah, there 
was no need to rush up here for the moment of sunrise because with all the cloud cover, it's a very gradual process. There's no uh, dramatic, oh, looks like, oh, there's my two puppies over there. So yeah, they're, they're temple, temple pups. They uh, know everybody here, I guess. And uh, I see a gate up there that is closed. Let's see what's going on. I did read something about this place not opening at certain times, but it did say open at 6 a.m. And it is 7.30 right now. So technically it should be open. It's also funny being here because you, you always see these please address politely signs at temples, you know, telling you what is allowed and not and not allowed. And it mostly seems irrelevant in most places. Who's going to go to a temple in a mini skirt and a see-through top, you know? But when you're here in Pai, you actually see a broad range of people. And a lot of people, like the foreigners that I've seen, have come here straight from the beaches. And they might have spent weeks down south in the tropical islands, you know, hanging out on beaches, really getting relaxed and fun-loving in their uh, approach to life and uh, the way they dress. So I've seen all kinds of foreigners here, like women walking around in bikini tops and uh, short skirts. I've seen guys walking around in uh, shorts and nothing else, like no shirt at all. Just they're on their scooter racing through the streets, uh, looking practically uh, half naked. So you do see a lot of foreigners with a much more casual and relaxed approach to dress because they just came up from you know, weeks on the beaches. So I think they have to be reminded that the bikini top and the mini skirt might not be welcome at the temple. Wow. Very uh, dramatic. Guardian lions. And here's the, uh, the guardian pooch. Hey there, pooch. Something else I've learned in my brief time in Thailand, feels brief even though it's been a while, is that it's okay to open things yourself. Like normally I see a closed gate like this, I would be reluctant to touch it. But I've been to a few places that had closed gates and then, uh, then the monks would come by and say, no, 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 you can open it, just, just open it up. So I think since it's supposed to be open at six and there's no padlock, I think I'm allowed to uh, roll it to the side and uh, go up. I guess I just don't have anyone whose job it is, is to every morning make sure the gate is open. And it's okay for you to do it yourself. I was saying on my way up here that I was fully expecting to find a bunch of other foreigners here. Uh, doing yoga, meditating, but with that closed gate down there, I have the impression that there's nobody else up here right now. After my trip to the Pi Canyon, the next day I returned to that area to look to visit a, a variety of attractions. There's the World War II Memorial Bridge, built by the Japanese, then burned down, then rebuilt, then washed away in a flood, then built again. And it's a big tourist attraction here. And in fact, the bridge, you see it a lot in the movie uh, Pie in Love. Our, all our characters who are busy falling in and out of love spend a lot of time in romantic uh, hanging out at the uh, Memorial Bridge. Um, so I went to the Memorial Bridge first thing in the morning, and then I was going to go to something called the Thai, or the Pai, 
uh, land split. Apparently it's a big gorge, big crack in the earth that opened up during an earthquake. And uh, you, it's like two or three kilometers off the main highway. So I went there, but I couldn't find it or it was closed, one or the other, or it doesn't exist, <laughs> I never know. But I think I found it, but it was just closed for some reason. So I didn't get to see the land split, but another 10 or 15 kilometers along that road, uh, you could also go to a waterfall, which I saw from the road. I didn't visit the waterfall, but I could see it. And uh, there was also a long bamboo bridge going across the fields. So I wanted to go see the bamboo bridge. I stopped here because the, uh, the big Buddha is uh, just ahead of me. Very serene. And from this point, we don't get much of a view because I'm still surrounded by uh, trees. But I assume it will open up a little bit further uh, up the stairs. So I never did see the land split, but the bamboo bridge was much more interesting than I expected. It was a much longer and more elaborate bamboo bridge stretching across the fields than I thought it would be. And it had clearly been developed. As, it, may have, it had a purpose in the beginning. There was quite a nice temple at the end of the bamboo bridge, the uh, forest temple. So it's really worth walking all the way to the end just to see this temple made out of wood and stone. Very beautiful. But it had clearly been developed as a source of income of tourism income for the villagers that live there. But they had done a lot of work to make it interesting for visitors like me. You know, it's a big fish pond. <laughs> I had such a good time at the pond because as, as I showed in the video, the pond looked empty. Normally when you go up to one of these fish feeding ponds, the uh, koi come rushing and thousands of them will come swimming over to where you are because they know they're going to get fed. But I stood there at the side of the pond and um, nothing happened. There were uh, no fish. There was uh, nothing uh, down there at all in the water. So I thought, I don't know what's going on, but I bought some uh, fish food just to see what would happen. Like who knows, maybe I thought the Loch Ness monster or crocodiles were down in there, who knows? So I grabbed some of the fish food, threw it out there and there was a delay of a second or two and then these huge catfish rose up from the bottom, you know, not swimming along the top, but they came from directly from the bottom, like swimming up vertically with their huge open mouths and started eating all the food. And they had those big long whiskers out the side. They, they look very much like uh, sea monsters. They really do. So that's what they have in the pond there. So as you toss out your food, these uh, dozens, maybe hundreds of large uh, catfish come whoa, racing to the surface. Well, racing catfish don't really race. They just kind of ah, come up and munch on all the food. And that, that was quite something. I had to lose my orange jacket. You can't win when it comes to temperatures, you know. The orange jacket isn't nearly warm enough for riding a scooter. I freeze to death every morning. It's so funny. And then I come walking up these steps and I'm just sweating to death. It's way too hot. So, uh, yeah, I'm actually soaking wet now. So I'm going to let the cold morning air dry me off. At the uh, bamboo bridge, they also built one of these classic stairways to heaven stairways to paradise, whatever you call them. It's basically a stairwell, a stairway that just goes up and stops. It doesn't go anywhere. And I don't quite know where this tradition came from, what it's supposed to be all about. But uh, I decided to walk up this stairway, got to the top, and to my surprise, I was frozen when I got there. And I, I've been thinking about it, 
And I think I know now what the problem was because later on, uh, uh, another foreigner showed up, a young woman, and she asked me to take some pictures of her as she climbed up the stairs. And she went up the steps and stood on the top like it was nothing. She had no trouble at all. She was fully relaxed up there. She just walked up to the top, stood up, and she, you know, struck all these poses for me to take pictures of her. Nothing at all. I got up there and, and I was like locked in position. I couldn't unbend my knees because the stairs were moving. And it was like, it felt like if I fought the movement of the, of the steps, I would end up just increasing it. You know how you can get that amplitude? It's like those bridges that start moving up and down because of the wind. And then it just gets more and more and more until the whole bridge snaps in half. It felt like that, that if I tried to, you know, kind of adjust, I would just end up shaking it more and then I was going to fall. I really felt like I was going to fall. And I, ha I found it hard to straighten up and look around because I kept feeling like I was going to lose my balance. It was <laughs> really something because I'm usually, I'm fine with heights. I'm fine with climbing around. All that kind of thing doesn't bother me at all. But uh, this stairway to heaven really defeated me. And I think I figured out what happened because because I, I was filming it with the GoPro and the way I had positioned the GoPro, I wanted to stand in a certain orientation facing the camera. So I ended up standing like this, sort of in the same plane as the length of the stairs. So as it was moving back and forth underneath me, it was creating this motion. But the woman, when she walked up, she had done the natural thing because she wasn't filming it and she had stood kind of parallel to it, feet planted wide on each side, and then she could stop the motion of the uh, stairs. And I think that was the difference. I was like standing this way with my feet close together, and then it was like being on a surfboard or something. And uh, she was facing the other direction, and it was much more stable that way. That's, uh, that's my theory, and I'm sticking to it. I'm not afraid. No, of course not. Well, I've been telling the story of the bamboo bridge and the catfish and the stairway to heaven while uh, right in front of the Buddha. Quite a dramatic sight. Oh, the hand is broken. The fingers on uh, the Buddha's uh, left hand are completely uh, shattered. Oh, interesting that that hasn't been fixed just for such a well-known and impressive uh, site. Sort of surprised it would be left like that. But let's turn around and see uh, what the Buddha is contemplating. And there's the view. Not quite the dappled sunlit scenery I was expecting or hoping to find up here. As I said, this has been the journey of mist, the journey of fog. And today it's been compounded by uh, rain clouds. It was after my trip to the bamboo bridge that I uh, dropped by uh, coffee in love. And that was, I think that was the end of my small adventures for that morning. And my next big small adventure was uh, Yesterday, I think, yeah, I've kind of lost track of the days. I think, uh, I think that is one of the effects that Pi has on you. You just sort of lose track of time here. So these days it doesn't take much to make me uh, lose track of time. Um, I've moved around to the, the back of the, uh, the Buddha statue. Yeah, my next big adventure was the next day, which I believe was yesterday, and I decided to go to the Lode Cave, which is about 50 kilometers uh, away from Pai, kind of on the road back to Mei Hong Sun. So that was kind of interesting that I was going to be uh, backtracking 50 kilometers, pretty much halfway to Mei Hong Sun to go to this cave. And as I talked about it in my video of that experience, um, it makes a lot more sense to stay at the cave. I, I forgot to mention it in the video, but there's a kind of a, a lower key 
uh, trekking, touring kind of guest house there called Cave Lodge. And I think it would the best way to go see this cave would be to stay at Cave Lodge in the village beside the cave. And then you can you know, stay there for a couple of nights, three nights, as long as you want. And then uh, you have a much more relaxed time going to visit the cave and you could return throughout the day, go back at to sunset at twilight to see the thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of uh, swifts, the birds flying out of the cave mouth. You know, that would be a better experience than what I did, which is fully possible, which is to wake up in Pi, ride your scooter 50 kilometers, you know, spend two hours at the cave and then you ride the 50 kilometers back again. That's also a very good day and I enjoyed it very much. But I think to get the most out of the experience, it would be better to stay there at the Cave Lodge, or there's another more fancy resort, I think, called something eerie, you know, like a mountain peak eerie, not spooky eerie, but the eerie. And uh, you could stay there. And there's a nearby, very nearby, just a few kilometers away on the main highway, a town called Bang Mapa, Bang Mapa, something like that. And there's a whole bunch of guest houses there, uh, some of which are quite popular. And you can stay in that town to visit the cave. That would be a good way to do it. You could even do it from Mae Hong Son as a day trip. Um, yeah, a variety of ways you can go see the cave. But I woke up here early in the morning. I rode up into the mountains to a viewpoint just at sunrise. And that's uh, where I saw a whole bunch of people performing yoga and meditation. And that's why I thought I'd find the same uh, basic you know, situation here, but there's nobody else here. And then I rode down off the mountain to get to where the cave is located and uh, had a really good experience there. I had my usual quirks about the whole thing, just weirdly organized the whole experience from my point of view, where you show up as a visitor and you have no idea what to do. It's like, okay, I'm at the cave. Uh, I know I'm supposed to buy a ticket, but you know, there's no clear indication of where you go, where you buy the ticket, where you go in. There's a big gate and to go into the whole complex where the cave is located. But as far as, and there was a, you know, a, a, a counter there where it clearly looked like that's where you're supposed to buy your ticket. But there's nobody there, the place was empty. I find that all the time, everywhere I go in Thailand, ticket counters are empty, coffee shops are empty. My even my nice hotel, there's never anybody there, you know, if you want to do anything or talk to anyone about something to do with your room or extending your reservation or doing anything, it's like, I don't know, there's, no, there's nobody there. There's just like no people anywhere. You go into restaurants, you sit down, nobody comes to your table, there's nobody behind the counter, there's nobody in the kitchen. I don't know where everybody is. Maybe it's a COVID thing, but uh, that's been my experience in Thailand. And the cave was similar and that I just didn't know what to do. So I kind of wandered around the outside for a while because I don't want to make a mistake, you know? I don't want to go in the place, go where I'm not supposed to go and have somebody yell at me. He's like, hey, get out of here, you know, which also happens quite a bit. But eventually I uh, just walked through the gate because that was the only thing I could do. And the second I stepped across that threshold, a soldier came walking up to me quite quickly. And he said, okay, we need to see your vaccine certificate. It's like, oh, okay. A lot of military there, a lot of soldiers, a lot of military trucks, uh, Humvees, things like that. I don't know why, but why the military would be so interested in this cave, but they were. And the soldier was enforcing the vaccine certificate business. So I pulled out my phone and I called up uh, more prom. This time I had a data connection. It took a while, it was really slow, but it eventually loaded and he looked at my vaccine certificate and says, okay, good. And then he escorted me to a counter on the inside and that's where you sign in and you pay your fee and they tell you about the cave. You can pay a certain amount to see just one cave a bit more to see two caves and then 500 baht to see all of the complex. There's like three caverns plus a rafting river trip. So you can do all of those things for 500 baht for a group of three people. I was only one, so I had to pay the 500 baht just for me. Uh, you know, that's a little bit on the pricey side for a place like Thailand, but uh, considering I had no choice and um, 
just the, 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 the experience itself to me was worth it. So yeah, I paid the 500 baht. I bought some fish food because I knew in advance that they have fish in the river. And people say, yeah, you should make sure you buy some fish food because you'll regret it if you don't. And yeah, I bought a big bag of uh, fish food. And then I was assigned a guide. I was hoping to get an English speaking guide. I was hoping they would look at me, oh, foreign dude who speaks English. You know, let's get him one of our guides who's the best at English. But it appear, they appear to just have a system where I, you get whatever guide is next in the rotation. And they had a big board there of 165 ID cards with names and photographs. There's 165 different guides. And you just get the next one that's available in the, in the list, however they organize it. Maybe they have shifts. Maybe they have a quota system. I don't know how they organize it, but they basically just got the very next guide who was this <laughs> sweet grandmotherly type of uh, woman. Anyway, I think I'm going to start making my way down as I keep chatting. Um, say goodbye to the, uh, to the Buddha image behind me. I think in terms of sunrise and uh, sunshine, this is as good as it's going to get for the morning anyway. So this is the, uh, the view from up here. I might have to return at uh, sunset because you can come right up to the very top on a scooter. So it'd be quite easy to do. But maybe if I want the full impact, I might have to come up for sunset as well. On my way down the steps. I don't know if I mentioned it, but my sweet grandmotherly guide was number 51. And a really fascinating thing about this cave tour is that you you, you, you have to have a guide that's part of the rules. And that's partially why you're paying so much money, I guess. And they use kind of, um, I was gonna, I kept calling them kerosene lanterns. They're the kind of lanterns that I'm accustomed to from when I was a kid, sort of like Coleman lanterns. And I remember my dad on uh, camping trips, getting the fuel and filling the base. And then you get these little, little white socks that, uh, hang in the middle of the glass portion, and then you have to pump it up to get pressure, and then you light it, and then you have to slowly increase the flow of gas, and, and it gets louder and louder like a jet engine. And once it's roaring and gets white, white hot, that sock, you think the sock is gonna burn up. What kind of sock doesn't burn? But no, it doesn't. It just sort of somehow is made of a material that just transfers the gas and uh, converts it to this you know, blast of bright, bright light. And those are the lanterns that they use there. I don't think they use kerosene anymore because I couldn't smell any kerosene. It's some sort of white gas, I guess. And that's what all the, the guides use. And they call them, I think they call them village lantern guides. And I really like that name. It's kind of got a romantic sound to it that all visitors must have a village lantern guide, you know. Sounds following a lantern through the cave. Sounds very uh, Lord of the Rings, you know, very mysterious and romantic instead of them having a big flashlight. Though, as I talked about on the video, there were problems with the lantern uh, because the way the lantern works, it, it throws out light in 360 degrees. So whenever the lantern was in front of me, which it always was because the guide is going ahead of me, it's blinding me instead of throwing light forward like a flashlight to, to light up what I want to look at, it's actually hitting me directly in the face and my pupils constrict and, and I end up, I can't see anything because the lantern is actually blinding me. So it's kind of a poor choice, to be honest, I thought for the cave. But it was kind of fun to see because as I was approaching the cave, it was very early in the morning, I read it opened at nine I don't know if that's the official opening, but I arrived there pretty much right at 9 a.m. And as I was approaching the cave, all the local people, the guides, were also going towards the cave, either on foot. All of them were elderly. That's one thing I noticed. I, I saw this one man walking along. He was holding, and the thing is, they were all holding their lanterns. So as they're walking towards the cave to start their day as the village lantern guide, they were bringing their lanterns with them. So I guess they take them home with them. I don't know whether they pay for them themselves. I was very interested in all these questions and they clearly took very good care of them. They were polished and shiny. The glass was clear. They all looked brand new actually. 
and uh, they were all, yeah, I saw them go by bicycle, by scooter, on foot, and all of them are holding their lanterns. It was their, um, kind of like a carpenter going to work with his tool belt and his, you know, his hammer and his tool belt. The tool of the trade of the village lantern guide was their lantern, and they clearly, you know, took it home every night and uh, took care of it and made sure it was filled with fuel and ready to go in the morning, and then they walked to work holding their lanterns, almost like a coal mine atmosphere. But they, they were all very elderly. One man I passed, as I said, he was, he was just sort of like hunched over holding his lantern. And he was like walking really, really slow. And uh, for a, a brief second, I thought about stopping my scooter and saying like, listen, I'm, go I'm going to the cave. Can I give you a lift the rest of the way? Because I'm not sure he was going to make it, you know. But the way the circumstances were, I couldn't really stop there and talk to him. And I got the impression he was busy chatting with all of his friends and neighbors as he was walking along. Um, and who knows if he got on the back of my scooter and he looked so frail, I wasn't sure he could even hold on. He'd end up dropping his lantern and uh, breaking it. So I just kept riding and he knows what he's doing. He's, I'm sure he's been doing this a while. And my guide, number 51, I took a picture of her ID card on the board. Um, yeah, also quite elderly, sweet grandmotherly lady. And I was just like hoping she was some kind of an English prodigy, despite her age and her generation. So I did ask her, you know, it's like, ah, do you speak any English? Because I wasn't sure how to approach her. And she said a little. And I... I tried her out with a couple of questions right at the beginning, things that I was curious about, and it was obvious she had no clue what I was saying, and she had no idea how to reply. So when she said she knew a little English, what she meant was that she knew the names of the animals that the stalagmites and the stalactites looked like inside the cave. So there's a King Kong uh, rock, there's a uh, Buddha rock, a crocodile rock, and then a waterfall, and this column. So she knew those words in English, so she would aim her lantern at the, the rock that looks like King Kong, and then she would say, King Kong, you know, the King Kong rock, and there's the crocodile rock, and <laughs> so it's like, that was her ability in English. And I don't understand why, but the soldier came with us the entire time. He was like a military escort. No other group had a soldier with them. But he stuck to me like glue, and it appeared to be his job to also help me out because he had a flashlight, and then when I was clearly interested in something to take video of it, he would, he would point his flashlight at it and light it up for me. A couple of times he offered to hold the GoPro for me so I could have my hands free to feed the fish and things like that. And he was taking care of my safety, uh, making sure I didn't bump my head. Uh, my, my village lantern guide was also very uh, concerned that I not bang my head against the rocks. He was like pointing out all the dangers and saying, oh, careful, 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 careful. But yeah, I had a military escort and I read the instructions at the beginning that talked about these village lantern guides, about what their job was. And they had a list of things, you know, that they're expected to do. You know, you, you must have a village lantern guide. That's the rule. And if we catch you in the cave without a guide, penalties apply. And they said the penalty was 500 baht, which, of course, is how much you have to pay anyway. <laughs> so the penalty was the same as the entrance fee. And then it said that the guide's job is to light the way, keep you safe, and control your behavior. Make sure that you don't touch the stalagmites and stalactites and that you stay quiet and respectful. So one of their jobs as an escort is to make sure that we as visitors, you know, behave properly. We dress properly and, and then don't damage the interior of the cave or do other, you know, behave against the rules, basically. But um, I'm not sure this sweet uh, grandmother would... Uh, have had the courage to tell me to stop doing things, but of course, I'm not about to be uh, uh, doing disrespectful things inside the cave or touching these stalagmites or stalactites. So yeah, I went in with the, uh, the grandmother leading the way with a lantern that blinded me the entire time and the soldier walking uh, behind me as I kept wondering, uh, why is that soldier following me? And he came with us the entire time. And I didn't learn anything about the interior from the guide. 
that's not part of their job. Their job is not to explain any of the geology or the history or anything like that. Or maybe they can in Thai, for all I know in the Thai language. She's a, an expert on geology, but in English, not so much. But I didn't mind that at all. I was content to just be on my own and follow her around the cave and uh, take video and chatter about whatever it is I chatted about on, uh, on camera. And I really enjoyed feeding the fish. That was a lot of fun. And the, the cave itself was massive, huge caverns. Really could have benefited by more lighting, I have to say. The lantern didn't help because, as I said, it lit up the place, but it also blinded me at the same time. So it kind of, the effect of the lantern kind of canceled itself out. And uh, the flashlights were not enough to light up the interior of this place. It really should be lit up on the inside. And considering the amount of money they take in on a daily basis, other than the past COVID year, of course, um, I think they would have more than enough money to string some lights in there and uh, buy a generator, but they haven't done that so far. But the cave would be amazing if it was lit up nicely on the inside. And the highlight, of course, is the, the ride on the bamboo raft down the river. I really enjoyed that. I was worried that the raft would be very tippy and very um, fragile and I didn't want to fall into the water with all my cameras and passport and have everything soaking wet. But it turns out that the, the bamboo raft was uh, very solid, very well built and it was barely tippy at all. Could easily handle four or five, the weight of four or five people. And uh, there was, each raft had a boatman pulling it along. Uh, for some reason, <laughs> I had the idea that the guide would take you onto the raft and your guide would operate the pole. And I was wondering the whole time, well, how is this, you know, 95 pound grandmother going to handle this giant bamboo raft? And I was relieved to see that the rafts had, they came with their own boatman. And I think when you go down, you're going down river. So all the boatman had to do really was kind of steer it. But when you come back, you're going up river and that takes a bit more effort. And then the soldier helped out. So I had the boat man on the front, pulling, pushing the boat, the raft, and then the soldier on the back also pulling the raft. So that was spectacular. Um, the rafting portion was the best because you're in the dark for a long, long time and you adjust to the dark and get used to it. And then you're going down the river towards the mouth of the cave, the exit of the cave and it just starts to get lighter and lighter and you're blinded by the light coming in from outside, which is amazing enough. But when you turn around to go back, you retrace your steps. And then now you're going up river into the cave with the light coming in from behind you. And this is the one time I really got a sense of what the cave looked like because now I had all the natural light behind me lighting the cave up in front of me. And I was being blinded by the lantern because the lantern was sitting on the, on the raft right in front of me. But I realized that if I lifted my hand and blocked the light from the lantern, suddenly the whole cavern lit up all around me. My eyes adjusted. So as long as I blocked the lantern and then I got this amazing view as you rode into the cave and then the light slowly disappeared and you went into the darkness. Yeah, tremendous experience. Yeah, really like that a lot. Um, yeah, yeah, it worked out really well. I didn't know what the cave experience was going to be like. Had I gone there on my own without a guide, I probably would have spent it twice as long, probably three times as long inside the cave itself. But of course I've got the guide and the soldier and you're sort of walking along with them. So, you know, I went through the whole uh, area uh, quicker than I would normally. A few other th interesting things of note from the cave experience. One was that they had built a dam made out of bamboo, rock, wood, mud, natural materials. They built a dam at the exit of the cave for the river to basically make sure that the water level was high enough for the bamboo rafts to uh, float along. And I thought that was quite interesting. I had read a number of times from, or I've seen some YouTube videos, people who visited the cave. The most recent one I saw, for example, was a young guy who went there and he wasn't able to take the bamboo raft because that part of the cave wasn't open. 
And I'm not quite sure, does that mean the water was too high? I think it meant it was just way too high. Uh, they never said it was because the water was too low, but maybe it was because the water was too low for the rafts. But in that case, I think you could easily walk through the river because it would only be like knee deep, I think. But anyway, they, they built this dam to raise the water levels and control the water levels, I guess. And that seemed like a very clever idea. Um, I, I started wondering what kind of you know, community discussions went on as they talked about this dam, you know, who came up with the idea, how long it's been around, really, I don't even know that. And of course, in the third cavern, the one where you get to on the bamboo raft, one of the big attractions there is that inside this cavern, there are a set of uh, teak wood coffins that date back thousands and thousands of years from the people that lived in this area, the Lawa people, perhaps. And there isn't very much remaining. Of course, there are no, no skeletons, no bodies of any kind. And the coffins themselves are like sort of shattered in a whole bunch of pieces. And it was hard to figure out how they were put together. But at the entrance, they have a, a replica. And um, from what I could tell, just glancing at it from a distance, because I wasn't sure whether I could get up close to it, this replica looked like it was a log like just like a solid log that had been hollowed out and cut in half and the body is placed inside the log and then they kind of carved the end with a unique sort of key and lock system like a joint system like wood joinery kind of thing yeah because at the very tip of the coffin there was some sort of a, a protrusion and it looks like they carve it in such a way that the two pieces kind of click together and form a locking mechanism of some kind. Yeah, that was quite interesting. In keeping with the theme of Thailand, they did have a large visitor center, but it was closed. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why, but it, there's this huge building that's at visitor center, and I was so excited because I wanted to go into the visitor center, you know, a museum, get lots of information before I go into the cave. So I'm marching confidently up to the visitor center and like, no, 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 closed, closed. So I was like, I don't, everything's always closed. But yeah, the visitor center was, I don't know, I don't know what's in there. I haven't heard anyone ever mention the visitor center. So maybe there's really nothing in there anyway. Maybe it's sort of a conference center meant for meetings and there's no like museum or anything like that in there. No displays. I don't know. The other impression I had from this cave trip is how nice the village was. It really was where this uh, cave is located. Really beautiful village, nice scenery, nice setting. And that's one of the reasons I recommend uh, staying there overnight if you can at the cave lodge or at the, uh, the Erie, you know, the fancy resort. Yeah, really nice. It's a Saturday today as I'm recording this little trip up to the Big Buddha. And I'm thinking Saturday night is the big night for the walking street here in Pai. So I'm planning on that being my, my big adventure for the day. Tonight, you know, once it gets dark, I'll head to the uh, walking street. I'm not quite sure how to record that experience because the GoPro is not very good at low light and I don't really have another suitable camera for that kind of experience. I'll probably end up using the GoPro and I'll just have to deal with the grainy image. But the other problem is that there's so much music there. There's bars everywhere playing recorded and live music. And uh, so it would be a challenging to record uh, audio there. But we'll see what I can do. I'll uh, keep, keep our camera running as I go to the uh, walking street. It's really, really impressive. I've been there once already. I went there with uh, Leon but I didn't uh, record any video when I went there. I thought about continuing this walk to downtown Pai and the walking street and along the river, kind of show uh, what that looks like right now. But um, I think this uh, video has gone on long enough. <laughs> Maybe I'll end it with a short pop culture update because I've been uh, off and on watching a show that really kind of uh, fascinated me and continues to fascinate me 
I don't think it's to everyone's taste, so I'm not coming out to recommend it. I think a lot of people would uh, end up disliking it for various reasons, but I've just been amazed by it. I've, I've been enjoying it so much. It's called uh, Station Eleven. And I think there are uh, 10 episodes. It's based on a book. And the topic may not, may also not be to everyone's taste because it's a little bit too current. <laughs> the story is of a time when a flu epidemic uh, was raging and it was a particularly virulent flu and it wiped out like 99% of the human population. And much of the story is about what happens to people when the world falls apart and civilization disappears. So it's a little bit close to home right now where everyone is dying of a flu. But if you can get past that and that doesn't bother you considering uh, our current situation, it's quite an enjoyable show. And it also works in multiple timelines and telling the same story from multiple points of view, from different characters. So as you watch the show, you may not really know what's going on exactly. There's a lot of things you don't understand. You're not quite sure what's happening, who some of the people are and why are they in the show and how do they relate to each other. But you just have to have confidence that the show is going somewhere. And with every episode, they just add another layer to the story, a bit more background, another layer, another layer. And it's not until you get to the very final episode that they tie everything together. And it's like, ah, those are all the connections, you know. So it, the show requires a bit of patience on your part. But I loved it very much. Um, the characters, the relationship between the characters, the uh, star playing a, a young girl and then an older woman called Kirsten is uh, Mackenzie Davis. And I had this interesting experience with Mackenzie. This happens a lot to me where I see someone in a TV show or a movie and I know I've seen this person before. They're so familiar to me and I really like them as an actor, but I can't remember where I know them from. It's like, oh, I know this person, but I can't. And I, and if I know them, it's because they made a big impression on me. But then I can't remember where that impression came from. So I watched a few episodes because I wanted to sort of let the memory come to me naturally, but I could not come up with it. So I finally had to look up Mackenzie Davis, look up her history. And as soon as I got to a Terminator Dark Fate, it's like, ah, that's where I know her from. She plays the enhanced human that comes back from the future. You know, she's human, but with robotic elements and enhanced abilities and powers uh, to fight, you know, the Terminators. And uh, that's Mackenzie Davis. And I think she was chosen for that role because she can be quite convincing as a physical threat. Like she has a, she's tall. She's not muscular in particular, but when you see her fighting, you know, and, and kicking butt, it's believable. It's like, yeah, okay, I can see this woman being that tough. She just has this thing about her. And I think that's why she was cast in this role because the character Kirsten in Station Eleven is also a fighter in a different way, but a very strong fighter uh, and savage at the same time, savage when she needs to be very impressive character so and just as an actor the whole show is based around the characters connected through a graphic novel that was called station 11 and i have no idea what the story is in station 11 you sort of get hints about it but it never comes fully clear um but all the the main characters are familiar with this graphic novel, Station Eleven, and they quote it to each other all the time, and there's imagery from it, and it's all very mysterious and dramatic. And a lot of the show is based on Shakespeare. So the main characters are part of a traveling troupe of Shakespearean actors 
who go around the world in the post-apocalyptic world that they live in and put on King Lear and Hamlet and, and show and plays like that in all these communities that are struggling to survive. And their performances, little scenes here and there from Hamlet and other things, I just found them to be really powerful and really kind of interesting. Just from beginning to end, I really enjoyed the show. Yeah, I really did. And Kirsten, the character in the movie, or in the TV show, she has a strong relationship. Like as a young girl, uh, she has this chance encounter with a man who becomes kind of her protector and guardian in the apocalypse. And this, his character's name is Jeevan. I know the actor quite well. Hamish Patel, I want to say. Could, something like Hamish Patel. I'm pretty sure it's Patel, maybe Hamish Patel. Very good actor, but I loved his portrayal of Jeevan in this movie, or in, in, in this TV show. He was very good, and the relationship between Jeevan and, and Kirsten I thought was so compelling. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot going on in this show, but you have to have a lot of patience for it. And you have to enjoy something that's very atmospheric and uh, not perhaps always that clear what is going on or what they're talking about. But uh, yeah, I enjoyed it very much. Station Eleven. <laughs> that's Planet Doug's pop culture obsession. I've also been watching The Expanse, the final season of The Expanse. And I don't have a lot to say about it because I've been left somewhat underwhelmed. I don't, I guess it's not the fault of the, of the TV series. I, I guess they're following the books and I guess whatever happened in the TV show is what happened in the books. But they seem to have left the most interesting parts of the story behind because at the beginning, it's all about the proto-molecule, this incredibly powerful alien substance that no one really understands. And they, as they unravel the mystery, they learn about these ancient alien species with unbelievably advanced technology, species that can wipe out entire galaxies. And there's hints about galactic wars with powerful entities that can, that has weaponry beyond our imagination and that I found all of that fascinating and it opens up ring gates that leads to thousands of galaxies spread across the whole universe it's like a big 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 amazing story and I wanted answers to all of that but towards the end it just sort of devolved into a military struggle between earth mars and the belters which I get, that's the world that the humans are living in. And there's a guy called Marco Inaros, who is causing a lot of trouble with his uh, rebel army. The, the free army, he calls it. But from the very first episode where they introduced Marco Inaros, I didn't like the guy as an actor, as a character. It just didn't ring true for me. I didn't find him interesting. I just thought he was kind of boring. I didn't like that part of the story. I kept wanting to get back to the proto-molecule. And then from that point on, the whole TV series was all about Marco Inaros fighting him, trying to defeat him and his rebel army. And that's how the show continues all the way to the very end. That's what the whole final season is about. And there's next, unless there's more episodes to come, but I think that was the final episode that I saw. And you just don't get any answers about anything. Anyway, I was kind of, I watched the final se season, but I wasn't that excited about it, to be honest. And as far as uh, movies go, the only movie that really sticks out in my mind is this really strange one called uh, don't look back. I'm uh, crossing the bridge right now, by the way, that I crossed earlier this morning, all the lanterns around me. And here's the, uh, here's the main river that runs through Pi. And there would be tons and tons of guest houses and uh, camping areas on both sides of the river over here. 
And now that the sun is up a little bit, you can see a little bit more on this side. But yeah, this is basically right in the heart of Pi. And you'd swear you're in a village. These are all guest houses and hotels and there's tons and more and more and more of them as you go along the river. But anyway, Don't Look Back is a really strange movie. Star-studded, I guess you'd call it. Tons and tons of famous, well-known actors are in it. And it's also an apocalypse story. This one is all about a comet that they discover. And the comet is, uh, looks like it's heading towards Earth. And if it hits Earth, which they think it will, it's going to destroy all life on the planet. So basically, it's the end of the world. And that's what the movie is about. And the basic idea is that the scientists are telling the world leaders this comet is coming and it's going to destroy the earth and all the politicians and all the leaders basically kind of ignore them and, and oh, look at this hey there i don't know what's going on i've got uh <laughs> Tons of dogs uh, barking at me and, and giving me a hard time. But then I've got all these really amazing puppies coming up to say hello. Look at that. Hey there. Yeah, this one's nice and soft. He's been, uh, had a bath, I think, or occasionally is cared for. Yeah, in Don't Look Back, all the politicians are ignoring the scientists. And, and, and to be honest, they even have a bit of a point. I thought the, 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 the movie was a bit unfair to the politicians because as, as the President of the United States pointed out at one point, someone comes up to them with a doomsday story every week. You know, there's always, I mean, as the President, all they ever hear about is Again, you know, climate change, the world is going to end, the comet's going to hit, the world is going to end, we're all going to starve to death, we're all going to run out of water, just like disaster after disaster after disaster. And then you've got two scientists who come in and say, oh, we've discovered a comet that's going to hit Earth, you know. And the scientists were expecting the politicians to just react instantly and for the whole world to go into emergency mode and try to save the Earth. And the president is saying, listen, we hear this every week. There's always something that's going to destroy the earth. Um, and anyway, anyway, they don't take them that seriously. Uh, it's Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, yeah, Jennifer Lawrence. Jonah Hill. Meryl Streep. Kate Blanchett in an astonishing role. Kate Blanchett, man, she's a force... She's a force of nature as an actress. Man, is there anything she can't do? Uh, Tyler Perry, I think, is in it, of all people. Yeah, the list goes on and on. And I'm not going to tell you it's an amazing movie and you have to watch it. It's probably not even a good movie. But it was a lot, I thought it was a lot of fun. It really was. Could have been better. But it was a lot of fun. And, and they did some things that I thought were quite unusual. You don't always see in a movie like that, I appreciated that. But an interesting thing is that I, I was watching or listening to a podcast called uh, Pop Culture Happy Hour from NPR. It's one of my regular podcasts I listen to. And they review pop culture, basically. And I saw that they, they did a review of Don't Look Back. So I was really excited about that. I wanted to hear what they had to say. And man, they dumped all over the movie. They hated it. But I didn't really understand their point of view um, because they knew something that I didn't know. And apparently the, the movie was done by Adam McKay, who's very famous for these kinds of movies talking about uh, modern current events like this. And I guess right from the very beginning, Adam McKay meant Don't Look Back to be an analogy for climate change. The whole thing was supposed to be a parody and an analogy for how the world is dealing with the issue of climate change. And I didn't know that. 
I didn't know anything about the movie. I just saw it and I watched it. I didn't know it was all about climate change. And the NPR reviewers just went on and on and on about how the issue of a meteor, a, a comet, hitting the Earth is not the same thing as climate change. It's different because of this, and it's not connected because of this, and you can't relate the two. And it's, you know, They went on and on, and all they focused on was this climate change business. And uh, I thought they were missing the point, because someone like me, I didn't watch the movie thinking, oh, I'm going to learn something about climate change, or I'm going to gain some insight into you know, the political inertia when it comes to dealing with the issue of climate change. I didn't have that expectation at all. I didn't know I was supposed to be expecting that. All I knew was that this was a, uh, you know, a fun, goofy movie about the end of the world full of uh, movie stars, and I just sort of sat back and enjoyed it. So, uh, yeah, NPR and Pop Culture Happy Hour in particular can get pretty overly concerned with they think about things too much perhaps and that's coming from me <laughs> I think one of my traits is overthinking everything but man NPR leaves me in the dust they overthink everything to death and they certainly did with Don't Look Back again not a great movie not a masterpiece but if you got nothing else to do you know it's a yeah, it's fun. I, I actually ended up watching it uh, two or three times, I think. Anyway, I'm almost back at my hotel. And it is 9 o'clock in the morning. Do hotels still serve breakfast at 9 o'clock? I think they do, right? <laughs> I, I never have breakfast this late. So anyway, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to look in the dining area and see whether I can get my breakfast. And, uh, yeah. That's the end of my walk for this morning, up to the uh, Big Buddha and back. Might be going to the walking street tonight, and if I do, that's the next video you'll see on this channel, and I'll see you in that video. Mm -hmm.